Hey folks, welcome back to Earth Sky. David Dallin here. And today we are talking about a Titanic collision in the in deep space. What has happened here is last week a group of astrophysicists detected an enormous black hole merger, the most powerful one ever seen. And it left at the, a black hole at the end of this event 220 times the mass of our sun. And here to tell us about it today is Phil Plate, the bad astronomer. He's going to bring us some good astronomy today. Hi, Phil. Howdy, howdy. How are you? Pretty good. So Better than those black holes are doing, I'll tell you that much, yeah. Yeah, black holes. Yeah, be better than those black holes. That must have been a very bad day. Um, so <laughs> we've got the biggest black hole merger ever, Phil. What does that mean? What you know? Let's start. What is a black hole, and what exactly is a black hole merger? I've got a picture here. We got ourselves a hole. Tell us what's going on. Okay. Yeah. So first things first. Um, everything in the universe that has mass has gravity. So the earth has a mass and it has gravity. The sun has a mass, it has gravity. Y you have mass, you have gravity, it's very small. Uh, and the amount of gravity that something has depends on how much mass it has. And the, the force you feel toward it depends on how close you can get to it. And the thing about black holes is, it's not that they're really massive necessarily, it's that they're small and you can get really, really close to them. So the force of gravity you feel gets very, very strong. You could have a, a black hole that has say the mass of the sun, say, um, and you would feel a much stronger gravitational force toward it because you can get really, really close to it because that black hole would be much, much smaller than the sun. And what happens is this things, these things have intense gravity. Things get too close to them. They can get torn apart. They can fall in. Uh, these things can blast out radiation. Uh, a lot of different things can happen. We know these things are out there uh, because we, we detect uh, the radiation coming from them or the way they affect their environment around them. Okay. And so... This is a merger. So I, I am assuming we had something like this going on out there. This is a pair of, of black holes orbiting closely. It's an, obviously an artist's conception. Yes. What is a black hole merger, Phil? So just like a lot of other objects like stars, you can have binary stars where two stars orbit each other. Um, black holes can do this as well. Um, we see uh, evidence of these things going on where like a black hole is orbiting a star and uh, it's drawing material off that star. If that star is very massive and explodes in a supernova, and I should have said this earlier, black holes can be formed when very massive stars explode. The outer layers blast away, but the core of the star collapses down and gets so dense it becomes a black hole. Um, if you have a black hole orbiting a star like that and the star blows up, now you got two black holes orbiting each other. Uh, and so we know that these things can exist. Over time, these, and we'll get into how this works in a minute, but over time, these black holes can start to uh, spiral toward each other, and this can take a long time, billions of years. But eventually, they get so close to each other that they eat each other. Just like anything else falls into a black hole, a black hole can fall into a black hole. So they're spinning around, getting faster, 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 and then whoop, they, they merge and form a, a single, more massive black hole. Okay, but little Phil here says the got a problem with our understanding. What exactly is this? This is challenging our understanding of black hole formation. How so? Can you tell us about that? Okay, first, my thanks to my friend Zach Wienersmith from Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial for drawing me as one of his cartoon characters. I love using that as my avatar. Um, yeah, so the problem here is that forming, we know a few ways of forming black holes, but the most common way for black holes um, that have a few times the mass of the sun is, yeah, you have this massive star that blows up at the end of its life and the core collapses down to form a black hole. There's a minimum mass you can have, and it's about three times that of the sun. Earlier, I said if, if the sun were a black hole, but it can't be. You, you really need to have something that it's uh, at least three times the mass of the sun. There's no real upper limit to that but there are practical problems with getting black holes in a certain mass range. Because it's forming from a star, the, there's an upper limit to how big a star can be, 100 times the mass of the sun, 150. We're not really sure, but it's in that range. And the core of that star isn't that big. It may have 20 times the mass of the sun. So when the star blows up, most of it is destroyed and blows away. And that inner core, which collapses down, might have 
10 times the mass of the sun, 12, whatever, but not really much more than that. And the fact is here in this, this last merger that we saw, which is by the way called GW231123, which stands for gravitational waves observed on 2023, November 23rd. Um, what we've deduced from this, this event is that these, these two black holes, one of them had a mass of 100 times the sun, and the other one had a mass of 140 times the sun. And that's too big. You can't directly make a black hole that size as far as we know in today's universe. The only way you can, you can have something like that is if black holes merged previously. So you had you know, several smaller black holes merge sometime in the past and built themselves up to these 100, 140 solar mass black holes. Uh, that's one way, but it, it's not clear how that would happen. It's very complicated. The physics, you need to have a lot of stars close together. And it's not easy to do that. And so mm, not sure if that's the way it happened. The other way is that very early on in the universe, there were stars that could be much more massive. The conditions in the early universe, a couple hundred million years after the Big Bang, were different than they are today. And stars could get much bigger. We don't know how big, but they might have gotten several hundred times the mass of the sun. So it's possible that if one of those blew up and formed a black hole, it could form a black hole that, that's as big as the ones we see. Nobody really knows. This is all theoretical. So right now, we're struggling to figure out how these black holes formed in the first place. Okay, so we don't exactly know how we could get to 100 or 140 solar mass black hole. That is, right. That's what's out of range for us here. Okay, so this thing is or is absolutely massive. We started with two black holes and we ended up, you know, one is 100, one is 140 solar masses, but we end up with something that's 225 solar masses. By my math, that's 15 missing solar masses. Where do we think they went? What happened to the other 15 suns? <laughs> I can I can do that math in my head too. Um, yeah, what happens is it was converted into energy, and and this is the part I remember when I first started reading about how this all worked many many years ago. And my first thought was, you know, where did that extra mass go? Oh, it gets converted into energy. And I thought, oh, but that's a lot of mass getting converted to energy. And when you do this, when you take something that is massive and convert it to energy. You use the equation, the famous Einstein equation, E equals mc squared, where the energy you get out of something is proportional to the mass you put in, times the speed of light squared. And you may be aware the speed of light is very fast. And when you square it, you get a very, very large number. Uh, and, and so um, taking 15 times the mass of the sun and converting it into energy is approximately the same amount of energy that, and, and if you do this in, in a, some, a fraction of a second, which is how long it takes these black holes to merge, uh, the energy emitted from this event was approximately the same or, or more than all of the energy of all the stars in the observable universe combined. And you might think, well, golly, that should be very bright, except it's not emitted as light. This energy is emitted as gravitational waves, which I alluded to earlier. And that's the key to this whole thing. And I'll let you step in for the segue. Okay. All right. Let me step, <laughs> step in with a segue. <laughs> How do we detect these guys? Here is an artist concept of two black holes coming together and throwing off some three-dimensional gravitational waves headed towards Earth, right? Or everywhere. Tell us about it, Phil. Yes. I'm glad you asked, Dave. Um, so what happens is this is this is the last untested. This was the last un untested prediction of Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, and that is massive objects when they accelerate, when they when they move faster, or they move in circles, they 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 make waves, ripples in the fabric of space time, and this is one of the most mind bending things you can possibly think of. In a way. It is similar to you throw a rock in a pond and it goes bloop, and then these ripples move outward from the rock. The rock has hit the water, deposited energy in the water, and then that energy moves away in the form of waves on the surface of the, of the pond. Uh, this is, it's similar. This concept is similar. It's very different, very much more complex, but it's the same sort of idea. Um, the black holes, as they're orbiting each other, are accelerating because they're, they're moving in circles. 
And that means that these, these it's making these waves that are rippling away from the black holes. And I should say in all directions, that, that drawing makes it look like it's only in two directions. That just makes it easier to draw. They're actually moving out in every direction. And as the black holes are emitting this, these waves, that takes energy. And that energy is coming from their orbit. So if you take away energy from something that's in orbit, it gets closer together. So these things are emitting waves that get closer together. As they get closer together, they move faster and faster because that's how gravity works. And they emit, a, they emit more waves. And then right before, the, the moment before they merge, a few seconds, these gravitational waves get incredibly powerful. And then they merge. A fraction of that mass is converted into a blast of gravitational waves. And what that means is that space itself, space-time itself, is, is expanding and contracting a little bit. By the time these waves get to Earth, because this, this thing happens 7 billion light years away, really far away, halfway across the universe. By the time these waves get to us, they're very much attenuated. They're very weak. Just like if you shout to somebody who's right next to you, they're like, ow! But if they're a long way away, they can barely hear you. Well, these waves get weaker too. And so what happens is as they pass through the Earth, the Earth actually expands and contracts a very little bit about the width of a proton, right? The proton, a subatomic particle over, you know, a 13,000 kilometer wide planet. So we can detect this because if you beam mirror, if you beam lasers at mirrors and let these two laser beams uh, uh, interact with each other, they create a pattern called a, a, a construction, a construction or interference pattern with constructive and, de and destructive interference. Very similar to when you're in a bathtub and you swish back and forth and the waves move back and forth. And when the two crests hit each other, they get really big. Same idea. With lasers, we can measure that interference pattern extremely accurately. And, and if a wave passes through this detector, the, the, the laser and the mirror move a little bit and it changes the interference pattern. And we can see that, measure that and say, aha, we have something that has merged. And by comparing this to the physics of how black holes merge, we can figure out, oh, they were probably this far away. They, the two things had this mass. This is their final mass. And you can tell other things about them too, like, like what their orbit was like and whether the black holes were spinning, which is a whole other topic. Uh, but that's how we detect these things. And you can, you can look up the Laser Interferometry uh, Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO, L-I-G-O. Ah, and we have photos of it now. These, mm -hmm. This is two separate observatories. One's in Louisiana and one's in Washington State. And they're basically laser and mirror set up where the lasers and the mirrors are about two kilometers apart. And that you, know, you want them really, the farther apart they are, the more they, they move apart when the wave passes through. So these are very large facilities. Um, and, and that's how this is measured. They, the laser beam is sent down a, a vacuum tube, basically an evacuated tunnel. And there are mirrors at the end and they bounce all around and interfere with each other. And, and that's how they measure it. This is an unbelievably complicated and difficult process. This was, we understood um, about gravitational waves since the 60s, I think. And people have been trying to uh, figure out a way to detect them. And it wasn't until 2015, only 10 years ago, when the very first one was detected. Uh, black hole merger, I should say, was first detected. The first black hole merger. Okay. And so we have a quick question here from John Lowe. Hi. So these waves are longitudinal waves, he asks. Is that correct, Phil? I don't know. Okay, I'm thinking good about question, that. John. I, you know, I kind of want to say it's a compression wave, but I don't think it. I don't think that's right. Uh, I don't. I don't think of it that way, and so I, I never really occurred to me to even ask this question. It's a really good question. I, I don't know if somebody out there knows. Uh, you know, drop it in the chat. Please do. Yeah, if you happen to know the answer to that, and I agree with this. Hi, Miss Martian. It's good to see you again. Uh, this is very cool. That's a very cool comment. So anyway. <laughs> We've looked at LIGO. That's given me one more question. What else? What other weird things are out there for us to discover? What might, might be lurking out there in the cosmic depths from billions of years ago, Phil? Well, as far as gravitational waves go, um, we've detected different black holes merging. I, I'm not, you know, and I, I tried looking up the number. I'm not sure how many. It's, it's over 100, I'm pretty sure, uh, of these detections have been made over the past few years. And um, all different kinds of masses of these black holes, some of them small, some of them big. This one was the biggest, um, but there are also um, neutron stars, which are super dense objects. When they collide, they can explode. It's called a kilonova, and they can create a black hole in gravitational waves, and we've detected those as well. 
There are also supermassive black holes, and these are the black holes in the centers of galaxies, and these have millions of times the sun's mass, or billions. We have not yet detected one of a pair of these uh, colliding. We, we are 99.999% sure it happens. The thing is LIGO can't detect it because it's detecting the wrong frequency of gravitational waves. It's like having a radio that doesn't go to the right uh, frequency that the radio station's broadcasting. However, the European Space Agency is building a space antenna called LISA, the Laser In Interferometry Space Antenna, I think, or Space Array, that is going to be able to detect these much longer wavelength gravitational waves. And we think those are happening all the time. We just can't feel them because they're so weak and at the wrong wavelength. So maybe soon, 10 years or so, we'll be detecting a lot more of these things from these supermassive black holes. So there's, yeah, a lot of weird stuff going on in the universe. That really, really is fascinating as always, Phil. There really are some very strange things going on out in the cosmos. Oh, thank you for bringing us some good astronomy. So one last question, where can people keep track of what you're up to when you're when you're not here educating us about these bizarre happenings? Where uh, you well, uh, and in fact, I am still doing that, but just in different venues. I've got a newsletter, which you can find at badastronomy.beehive.com and beehive is B-E-E-H-I-I-V.com. And I'm on Blue Sky under my name, Phil Plate. You can find me there. Okay, awesome. Go check that out. Phil, thanks again for being here, my friend. It was great to have you back. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Yeah, and hang around backstage. We'll chat a bit. Okay, folks, <laughs> that wraps it up for today. Wasn't that great? Thank you all so much for being here. Give us a like if you got something out of it, or even if you didn't. <laughs> and if you're not subscribed, please do join us. We are here every weekday at the same time. That is 1715 Universal Time Coordinate, UTC. And on Monday, you don't want to miss this. We're going to be talking about the summer meteor season. It's right around the corner. Where's When's the best time, and what are you going to look for? Find out on Monday. One Earth, one sky, Earth sky. <laughs>